Hi, I'm Brendan, and today we're going to be walking through a reverse cache engineering problem. Uh, these problems can be a little bit tricky, so I think it would be good to walk through an explanation of solving one of these. So this problem that we'll be going through today is the cache, reverse cache engineering problem from the winter 2018 final. So if you want to follow along from there, you're welcome to do so. And in fact, I encourage you to try solving this problem on your own first before you watch the solution in this video. Secondly, since these problems can be a little bit long, I'm not going to be performing all of the cache simulations. I'll really just be talking more uh, in terms of the theory. So um, you're more than welcome to pause the video as I'm going along, um, stop and think about what I'm saying. So really just go at your own pace. So with that being said, let's start with this problem. So I've written out the, the, all the axes and then the memory addresses. Something else I've done that isn't given in the problem is converting the hex addresses to binary because when we're doing the uh, breakdown of the memory addresses to see where things would go in the cache, the binary address is going to be what gives us the most information. So I've gone ahead and, and done that. And then lastly, we were given the different hits and misses and so now our goal is to figure out the entire cache structure. We're actually really given nothing. We need to figure out the block size, the associativity, and the cache size. So it is a little bit daunting of a task, but thankfully the way this problem starts out is slightly leading in a good way for us. And so we see that we're given part A and part B. And so part A is uh, asking us to look at access numbers one through three and to report the range of the possible block sizes. And then part B is the same thing, except now we're looking at accesses one through four. So let's start with part A. So remember, our goal is to figure out what is the possible range of a block size given accesses one through three. So <clears throat> given that we're looking for the block size, let's quickly remember the uh, breakdown of what an address looks like when we're trying to access a, a cache. So, if we have this as our memory address, remember there are three sections. We have this part, the leftmost part is the tag. The middle part would be the set index. And then the last part would be the block offset. And so when we wanna look into our cache and see if something is a hit or a miss, remember that the two parts of the address that need to match what's in the cache are the tag and the set. So we know that everything left of the block offset has to match something that's already in the cache in order for us to have a hit inside of our cache. And so even though we weren't given anything in this problem about the cache size or the associativity, we have no idea where the cutoff will be from the set to the tag. We don't really need to have that cutoff information between the tag and the set to figure out the block offset or the block size in general, because again, we just know that we need everything left of the block offset to match. So now that we um, kind of covered that, and again, feel free to pause and think about that statement to see if you can verify that it's true. Let's look at axes one through three. So first off, we notice that on our first access, of course, we have a miss since it's our first access into the cache, it's a compulsory miss. And then our second access is a hit. So we see that the addresses are the same, except that the first one has a one here and a zero here. So going off again, what we were saying before, we need everything left of the block offset to match, which means that looking at these two addresses, at a minimum, we need the block size to be two, or another way to say that is, the number of bits we need to reserve for the block offset is one because in this case, everything left would be a hit, and then if this was any shorter, i.e. Uh, a block size of one or a block offset of zero, then we wouldn't have a match here. So that's what we can gather from the first two axes here. And now finally we see for the third axis, now we have a miss. So we can kind of work in the opposite direction here. And so if we had all of these bits reserved, for the block offset, these four least significant bits, then we would see that everything would match, so this would have been a hit. So we know that it can't be this large, that would be too big. And so if we go one bit in, now we would see that we have a one here. And again, we can draw these lines here, and I think visually 
picturing these lines is really helpful in solving these problems. So if we have three bits now for the block offset, we would see that this, in fact, would be a miss because everything left of the block offset doesn't match our previous hit. We have a one here, and so the tag and set index combo wouldn't match. So that means that at a minimum, our block size is two, and then at a maximum, our block size would be eight. And so that's just from axes one through three. And now if we do the same thing for access four, let's take a look here. And we see that it's very similar to access three, except we see that now these two bits are a one and a zero instead of a one and a one. And we see that it's still a miss. And so let's think about the case where if we extend this line down, both these lines down, if we reserved three bits for the block offset, which means that the block size is eight, then everything left of the block or everything left of the block offset in access four would match what was in access three. So that means that this would have been a hit in the case that the block size was eight. So that means that now this line is no longer valid in the sense that this is too large of a block size. If we go one line in, so now this looking at a block size of four, we see that now everything left of the block offset is different from all the previous axes. And so then that means that this would be a hit. So a block offset of four, or a block size of four, I should say, would work in this case. So now we've sort of narrowed our range down to be either two, two byte blocks or four byte blocks. We would see that nothing changes from the lower bound here of two bytes. Again, feel free to verify that uh, statement if you pause the video. And so now the answer to part B would be two bytes at a minimum and four bytes at a maximum. Another thing is in this problem, and almost 99% of the time, we're just going to be assuming powers of two. So we basically have two options, either two byte blocks or four byte blocks. So now that we tackle part A and part B, let's figure out the rest of the structure of this cache. So the way to really tackle going about finding the entire cache structure is through a lot of trial and error. So in this video, I'll be pointing out that combinations of accesses that I found relevant to solving this problem, but do know that, of course, it is very natural to be looking at other accesses, and if you find that there isn't any useful information, that's okay. So we narrow down the block size to be either two bytes or four bytes. So let's figure out which of these the block size actually is. So if we take a look at access seven and access nine, we see that access seven and access nine are the only two accesses that have this first hex character of three. Or in other words, their most significant four bits here are both zero, zero, one, one. And this tells us that access nine is going to be a hit as a result of access seven already being um, in the cache. And so given that, if we take a look at the least significant bits, the least four significant bits of these addresses, we see that they're almost the same, except these last two bytes differ. So we see that this is a zero and this is a one. And so what that tells us is if we look at the block offset possibilities, so first we could say, let's say that the uh, block size is two bytes, so a block offset of just one bit, we would see that everything left of the block offset does not match because this is a zero and this is a one. So that means that a block size of two is not possible. And we need to expand the block offset to be an extra bit, so two bits for the block offset. And now we see everything left of the block offset matches, and so then that means that this would be a hit. So that means that we can conclude that the, the, <coughs> the size of a block is four bytes. And now that we know that, it's really useful to just draw in this line so we can visualize for the rest of the problem that those are our block offset bits, and we've already completed that part of the problem. So let's go ahead and do that. So now the next part of the question asks us to figure out the associativity of the cache. And so it gives us three options. It says either direct mapped, two-way set associative, or fully associative. So 
So generally when I do these problems, it is really personal feel, but I like to try out the extremes first to see if I can gather any information that way and then uh, eliminate as I go. So first, let's try doing fully associative. Let's see if fully associative would work. And so in terms of our memory address, what that would look like is, again, these last two bits would be the block offset that we already figured out. And then everything else would be the tag. So this would be two bits, and then everything else is the tag. So let's see if that would hold up in this particular set of cache accesses. So one interesting point here is that we see that access two and access 10 have the same hex address, all just zeros. And we see that all the way down here, access 10 is still a hit after all of these other different cache accesses. I think there's seven in between two and 10. But we see that 10 would be a hit because of uh, access two, because everything left of that block offset is what matches. <clears throat> And so that being said, we can also notice that uh, we have a few other accesses in here. Um, for example, we have the access five and access eight, where we have five as a hit and then eight is a miss. And we see that everything left of that block offset also matches each other. So if it was fully associative, we would expect this to be a hit if we also had two and 10 being a hit. So, this is also something I'd recommend that maybe you can draw out the cache and simulate it. But with that, with those sets of accesses, we see that fully associative is impossible. So we can go ahead and eliminate that as a potential option. So now looking at the other extreme, we have direct map. So looking at direct map, we can go through sort of a, a similar uh, approach here. And so direct map is saying that now in addition to having a tag, we have these set index bits here. And so seeing if something is direct map is a little bit tricky because the set index bits tell us how many sets we have in our cache, but we don't know how big our cache is either in this question. So this one also is a little bit uh, heavy on the conceptual side. But what we can do is look at the same set of axes five and eight these are very useful to us. In addition to five and eight, we can also look at eight and nine. And so um, really in this entire range here, again, we see that five is a hit and seven, or sorry, five is a hit and eight is a miss. And they have everything the same left of the block offset. But then we see very similarly, um, seven is a miss, whereas nine is a hit. And so what this is telling us is if this was a direct mapped cache, then we would have each block be its own set. So we'd have, uh, essentially it would be um, like a one-way set associative cache. And so if we had this as a hit and eight as a miss, but then we have seven as a miss and nine as a hit, we would know that if it was direct map, this would have to be a hit as well, access eight, because we already have access seven and access nine being a miss and then a hit. So we would expect five and eight to follow the same pattern. So that means that direct map also is impossible. Again, it can be kind of hard to visualize without simulating the cache. So that's another, uh, this would be another part where I recommend you to uh, pause the video and really think about that and, and see how the, that point is true. We can't have direct map because of these accesses five and eight and seven and nine. So that means that we have to have a two-way cache because fully associative and direct map were impossible. So it's great. We know we have a two-way cache, a two-way set associative cache. So let's remember what that means. So that means that for each set in the cache, if this is one set, it means we have two lines per set. Another way to think about it is two blocks per set. And so remember our block size is four bytes. So we would have in one set, if this is a set, we have two blocks of four bytes and four bytes each. So now the last part of the question is to ask us to figure out the total size of the cache itself. And so another way to think about that is how many sets do we have in general? And so if we can figure out the number of sets, we know how many blocks are in each set and we know how many bytes are in each block. So we would be able to deduce the total uh, size of the cache.
So the way I'll be going about this part of the problem is figuring out how many bits need to be allocated for the set index. So again, I like to start on the extreme side of things. So let's start with the case where perhaps we would want to try uh, having four bits be the set index. So that means that four bits left of the block offset is where our set index would start. Or would, yeah, would start. And so that would mean that everything left of this would be the tag, this would be the set index, and this would be the block offset. So now going back to our, our trusty axes five and eight, we would be able to see that if we draw in these lines here, so yeah, four bits for the set index and four bytes, four bits for the set index. So uh, given this, so we would see that the, oh, sorry, that's seven. So now if we do it for eight, we see that the set index bits match. So these would be in the same set and they have the same tag. There's nothing in between axes five and eight that would have evicted something from this set. So that means that eight should have been a hit. So that means that having four set, in, set index bits is too many. And the same case goes for if we tried to do three set index bits, because we would see that we still have this case where five and eight are in the same set, six and seven are in different sets. So nothing should have evicted five from its set but eight is still a miss. So five is still, or excuse me, three set index bits is still too many. So now we're left with either one set index bit or two set index bits. And so that would be either like this case or that particular case. So we're down to those two potential options. So now looking at access two and 10. So if we look at two and 10, we see that, uh, Pretty quickly, actually, if we only had one set index bit, so we can just draw that line all the way down. So that would be as if we had one set index bit. We see that there are a ton of axes that only have set index of zero. And since we have a two-way set associative cache, with all of these other axes that have set zero, since two and 10 are a hit, both hits, 10 wouldn't really be a hit. It's not possible for 10 to be a hit given all these other axes that are also in set zero. Again, I encourage you to simulate that and pause the video and see why that's true. But really the gist is because we have so many other axes in set zero, 10 wouldn't have been able to be a hit if we only had one set index bit. So then if we were to do two set index bits instead, then we would see this is the combination of set index bits, block offset bits that would work for us, and that would allow us to have this particular combination of hits and misses. So we know that there's two set index bits. Everything else is the tag. So we have two set index bits, which means that we have two of the two sets, or four sets. Each set has two blocks, and then each block has four bytes. So that means our total cache size is 32 bytes. So that's the end of the problem. I know these can kind of uh, be quite tricky and time consuming to solve, so feel free to watch this video multiple, multiple times. And remember, practice makes perfect, and in no time you'll be able to figure out how to solve all of these different reverse cache engineering problems.